If you are an intern, student, or early career mental health professional, and you hear people throw around the term differential diagnosis, but you don't really know what the heck they're talking about, you are in luck because I've got some fun and quick methods for you to easily understand how to apply this concept in your clinical practice. First, let's start with a quick refresher of our trusty friend, the DSM-5-TR. And if you're familiar, you know that there's many more sections for each disorder than these headings, but these are some of the elements that I'm going to focus on for the purposes of this video. So for each disorder, you'll see those colored boxes that have the diagnostic criteria, and that looks at what symptoms should manifest in order to receive that diagnostic label. Often it talks about duration, different elements. And so, for example, We've got for trichotillomania, a recurrent pulling out of one's hair, resulting in hair loss, and repeated attempts to decrease or stop hair pulling. Those are the main diagnostic criteria for that one. Some are pretty simple like that, and some are much more complex. And most disorders also include caveats like that it must cause clinically significant distress, or it's not better explained by another medical condition or substance use and so on. And then some, but not all, disorders have an option to add a specifier. So it'll list what you can specify for that one. And it's basically giving some additional detail about the presentation of that diagnosis. For example, with anorexia nervosa, some specifiers include, you can specify if it is a restricting type or a binge eating purging type. You can also specify if it's in partial remission or full remission. And then each of them has a section called differential diagnosis, where it lists similar diagnoses and basically explains how those diagnoses are different and how you would distinguish between the two. For example, with antisocial personality disorder, some differential diagnoses include, but not limited to, substance use disorders. So maybe someone is acting in a more antisocial, mean or aggressive, uh, non-empathetic manner because of substance intoxication. Or it could also be a criminal behavior that is not associated with a mental disorder. So potentially crimes committed for gain uh, or, or for some compelling reason rather than a, a personality disorder as more of a, an internal thing. So it kind of explains what's the difference, what might this look like, and how do they differ. Now let's go on DSM Safari, but you didn't see that coming. Let's say that a clinical social worker and a zoologist co-authored a new bestseller, The DSM for Wild Beasts, and in that book you'd find the diagnosis of Jaguar. Here's what the diagnostic criteria might look like for Jaguar, say it might say it has, has to meet the first three of these criteria listed here, and that four and five are optional, for example. It might also specify if this Jaguar has extra sharp claws, a hungry look in his eye, if he's hiding in a tree, and so forth. So you can see that it might just be diagnosis Jaguar based on these five criteria. And optionally, you might have a specifier if it meets one of these additional criterias. It might be listed as one of the differential diagnoses for our friend the Jaguar. The differential diagnosis might say, well, a cheetah is faster and it's a little slimmer and its spots are smaller and they're all black instead of having this outline with color in the middle. Notice that this is not an exhaustive definition of what a cheetah is. That would be found in the cheetah section. Instead, this is just a short comparison of the two. And likewise, tiger could be another differential diagnosis. It's also orange, kind of a stocky big cat, but it's got stripes, not spots. And then finally, let's say the third differential diagnosis might be a house cat, a Bengal house cat, which has similar spots, but it's much smaller, cuter, cuddlier. It lives indoors typically with humans, and it's less likely to rip your face off. So that's how you would distinguish, that would be a differential diagnosis for a Jaguar. What you would not see listed in differential diagnosis for Jaguar would be tree frog. Because who would get a Jaguar confused with a tree frog? They are nothing alike, if you ask me. 
So just like there are many animal species, the DSM has more than 70 disorders, and it just wouldn't be practical or necessary to compare all of them every time. So it's just the ones that have some overlap. Now, you're probably not treating ferocious wild cats in your clinical practice, so let's take a look at a real-life example. I'm going to pick bipolar 2 as an example. Now, this is quite simplified, and if you want to follow along with me and read along, this starts on page 150 to 153 of the DSM-5-TR. And so that explains this diagnostic criteria in much more detail, but Let's just simplify and say that you need a hypomanic episode along with a major depressive episode. The specifiers include, but not limited to, things like if it includes rapid cycling with peripartum onset. So this is where your Latin comes in handy. Peri means around, like perimeter, and then partum means bringing forth or birth, so around birth. So that's if the onset of those mood symptoms occurs uh, during pregnancy or within four weeks of delivery. Or you can specify if with psychotic features. And the DSM actually further specifies if those psychotic features are mood congruent or incongruent. But let's just say psychotic features, meaning the presence of delusions or hallucinations. Cool. So... Following a comprehensive assessment by a qualified professional, someone might be diagnosed with bipolar 2, say, with seasonal pattern. That's one of the specifiers. But then you might wonder, well, wait a minute, what's the difference between that versus seasonal affective disorder? Or what's the difference between bipolar 2 with peripartum onset versus postpartum depression? Or how can I tell the difference between bipolar 2 with psychotic features compared to schizophrenia? or schizoaffective? Well, I'm so glad you asked because that's what differential diagnosis is for. So here's some examples for bipolar 2 of what differential diagnoses are listed. It starts with major depressive disorder and it explains that essentially in major depressive disorder you don't have manic or hypomanic episodes. And so if you can only give the bipolar 2 label, if symptoms you know, meet that hypomanic episode criteria that's listed in diagnostic criteria. And then cyclothymic, which is typically a more mild but longer lasting version of a bipolar related disorder that includes numerous periods of hypomania, but they don't quite meet all of those symptom or duration criteria specified. It's a longer time frame. So it kind of explains, right? Here's the difference between the two. And then, since I mentioned schizoaffective, here it is. It says, if psychotic features only happen during a major depressive episode, then you would diagnose bipolar 2. Uh, and if delusions and hallucinations occur for at least two weeks in absence of any depressive episode, then it would be schizoaffective. Again, pretty simplified. And, and of course, I would recommend looking at the full definition of each of these to really compare notes but it's a helpful quick reference if you're not sure how two of them relate. So if this was helpful, I encourage you to check out my clinical playlist on YouTube and uh, comment if you have any other thoughts on this.